priest's responsibility to finish the thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's good thing to bring up. Yeah. So just so you know, I'm on a, I'm starting off on a wide shot here, just sort of like clear up. Okay. okay. okay I'm just gonna give it a second for the thing to die down. And so you're gonna be looking at me. So first of all, who are you? Tell me about yourself. <laughs> Could you be any more broad? <laughs> sure, yeah. What's your name? Where are you from? A little bit about yourself. You're married. You have kids. Sure. I'm Scott Burton. I live in Winnipeg. I'm an ultra runner. It's my hobby. Perhaps it's more than a hobby. It kind of takes over many parts of my life. I am married. I have two kids, a son and a daughter, uh, 12 years old and 8 years old. And uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> what, what's an ultra runner? Well, technically, an ultra marathoner is someone who participates in events longer than your traditional marathon, so 26.2 miles over that, right? And there's, there's different opinions on that. You know, some people will say that a 50K race is an ultra marathon, which is really just, you know, eight kilometers over a standard marathon. But then there's the purists who say that. 50 miles is where it starts at ultra marathon and then there's the ultra purists that say that 100 miles is sort of the ultimate benchmark standard as far as ultra marathon but no technically speaking an ultra marathon is anything over a standard 42 kilometer marathon okay. and so what um so i'm just thinking for a second sure uh, okay what i'm gonna do Once in a while, I'll have to stop because uh, this this guy in the camera records for 12 minutes and it pauses, so I just have to stop and start a couple times. Gotcha, sure. Okay, so, all right, Mr. Ultra Marathoner, <laughs> how long have you been doing these longer than marathon length type of runs? Maybe tell me about some of the runs you've done. Sure, you know, I actually started doing ultra marathon, or, or sorry, I, I started attempting. Sorry, let me pause you for one second. Okay. Uh, if you're looking at me right here. Yeah. I'm going to move my head. I want you to tell me what's directly behind my head. Okay. Yeah. It's that pole there. Okay. So if so. I have to move for some reason, look at the sure. camera. Try to keep your eye line on that pole. Okay. I'm just trying to remember what the date would be. 2002, I think. So it's 2015. So about 13 years. 13. Uh, so, uh, gotcha. Okay. okay. So how long have you been doing ultra marathons? Well, I decided to do my first ultra marathon about 14 years ago. And I should really say attempting because back then I hadn't even done a marathon yet and I started to attempt some of these longer ones and honestly probably the first decade I really wasn't finishing them. It's only the last four years now that I've really developed the uh, endurance, the skills and, and I, I suppose the experience and the smarts to be able to actually get through these. So it's been great but uh, it actually takes a lot of, a lot of uh, work to prepare for these things. What kind of preparation do you do to prepare? Or like, what kind of things do you prepare for when it's... Because I guess it's different than just running a regular marathon, right? So what would be different? Yeah, you know, I suppose training is a lot similar to a standard marathon, but you just do a lot more really, really long distances. Uh, I sometimes do as much as 50 miles. Sorry. I'm just trying to think, what, what would be the difference between a... This is me thinking too technical here. Um, but have you run regular marathons as well, like or marathon length runs? Did you start with those first before you started doing the ultra? Yeah, you know, actually I didn't. I, a lot of people do go from marathons and graduate up to ultra marathons. I sort of skipped that marathon part. And so I've really been doing a lot of really long, slow distance runs. And that's been my preparation. Because the long runs do two things. One, they allow the body to get used to these sort of distances, but also the mind too, because there's a lot of uh, patience and uh, mentality behind it to be able to actually get through it. Because they oft often they say an ultra marathon is 90% mental and then the 10% physical sort of thing. So at least what, on the day. What kind of mental things do you do to prepare before the day? Mental, mental, you know, I do a lot of mental practice in, during my runs. I try to relax my mind. You know, there's a lot of patience involved in these sort of things. 
you know, you, you, you could go out and do a 10 kilometer race and you go as hard as you can and it's done in half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, a fairly short period of time. But once you start talking about 15, 20, 24 hour or longer sort of events, then really I think a lot of the skills, at least that I'm trying to develop, is to allow the my mind to just sort of relax and be patient, take everything in, in the moment sort of thing. And a lot of ways I equate it to meditation. Like I'm not really someone that has ever done meditation, but I would say that it's, it's quite close in that you really do have to relax and be in the moment and not think about what you're going for, because that could be 20 hours in the future. You gotta be able to just enjoy the experience where you're at. And in fact, for some really long distance uh, races that I'm doing, I found that a really great mental trainer is to be on a treadmill <laughs> and doing hours, hours and hours of workouts because that really uh, is challenging for the mind to be able to, you know, instead of just constantly, I want to get off, I want to get off, I want to stop, just to be able to quiet that down and really master the mental game by uh, just going hours in a, in a boring situation. And, and a lot of times that's, that's, that's a training. So. You mentioned longer than 24 hour races. What was that all about? <laughs> why, why are you doing that? <laughs> um, or what, what's a, a long race that you either have done or planning on doing that when you're longer than 24 hours? Sure. Well, for some reason, I've never been really content with any one particular style of racing. Like I used to do triathlons. I, I, I graduated into doing these sort of uh, 50 kilometer, 50 mile races and things like that. And I work really hard to accomplish a particular distance. But whenever I get there, it seems that I always need to do something different. You know, some people will do a certain uh, uh, a marathon or 50 miler or 100 miler or something like that, and they'll just continually want to get faster and faster and faster. But what excites me is to be able to say, well, how long or how far can I go? Because I'm not really, my body isn't fast or I'm not aggressive in my mind, but my skills has to do with going longer and longer. My, 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 my current training is for six days. For six day race which is 144 hours of a, it's, it's a constant event and I did this in Arizona last winter I only made it three and a half days of it but I did get 200 miles and, and that was my benchmark so I got 200 miles in three and a half days and this year I'm working towards actually the next two years I'm working towards getting to a point of 300 miles in an event in six days uh, that's my next milestone that I'm trying to get to does that include rest time during that, or is that? Sure. Yeah. Well, well, in a in a, sorry. Like a multi-day race. Yeah. Like so so a lot of times there are timed races, meaning 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, or six days. There are timed races. So basically, it's how much distance can you get during that period of time. You're not ranked by how uh, how long it takes you. You're ranked on the distance in an equal amount of time for everybody. So within that time period that you have, you can run, you can walk, you can sit and have a picnic, you can have a sleep, you can do whatever you want, but whatever you do affects the distance that you can get to. It's just open-ended, like you figure out how to spend those six days. Exactly. So some people are extremely skilled and inhuman perhaps, they can only get, they can do 30 minutes of sleep a night for six days. Other people need like eight hours a night. Uh, this last time I was doing it, I was getting about three, three and a half hours a night. It seemed to be going well, but my legs just weren't conditioned yet for that level of mileage yet. But I'm working on it. That's the thing, you know, once you get to a certain milestone and then you do it, your body can do it easier. And then I look towards what's the next level. I'm not conditioned to that. So I start training and working towards that next mileage goal of mine. That's a good way to put it, mileage. <laughs> I'm just going to move the mic slightly. Do you know uh, this this year I'm actually doing well like, like last year we were in Arizona for Christmas time and that's when this uh, race is it's called cross the years because you start the race in one year and you go into the next year oh, okay. you know so it goes over New Year's yeah. which is it's a fun concept yeah 
So last year we were there at Christmas, I did that race, six day race, which is really great because we we're only there for about two weeks and my family gave me six days to do this race, which is pretty, pretty generous on their part. And this year we're not going at Christmas time, we're actually going to Disneyland uh, at the end of January or beginning of February, so we won't be there for it. But this year, because I have this two year plan to get to 300 miles, I am doing a rehearsal just around in my neighborhood. So I'm doing a six day race. And actually I, sh I should explain, see, uh, in Manitoba there is a race called Lemming Loop and it's a 24 hour timed race. It's really the longest time race that we have in Manitoba. And obviously 24 hours, it's a Living Prairie Museum. So I'm gonna do the 24 hour Lemming Loop race, but I'm gonna start five days earlier. And so I'm just gonna use my house as the aid station spot. I'm going to run around my neighborhood as much as I can for five days. I'm going to sleep in the garage, uh, have my food and everything out there, microwave. It's all going to be in the garage, all set for me. So it's a, it's like a perfect race rehearsal. So for five days around my house, then because Living Prairie Museum is only about five, six kilometers away, I'm going to walk or run over to the start of the race and I'm going to do 24 hours there with the idea is that this 24 hour race will give me the motivation to actually stick it through the time period. You know, like no matter how slow I'm going, I'm gonna be motivated to get to the end and be with my friends for the last 24 hours. So, so that's, the, that's this year. I, I have no idea why I get motivated to do these things, but I'm rather excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, is it, is, does it give you an adrenaline rush or what is it that, that keeps you going to try to push yourself further and further these kind of events? Yeah. Uh, some yeah. fitness thing for you? Uh, what is it that's, that's making you want to keep doing this? Well, I've always been fascinated with uh, psychology, you know, how our mind works. These sort of ra runs that I do, I mean, certainly you can argue that it's not really good for your health. <laughs> you know, a lot of articles and studies in that will say that just 20 or 30 minutes of, of uh, light uh, aerobic activity is all you need to be healthy. But no, I like I tried that once where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to work out for health, and I was never motivated to do it. So I certainly understand all the people who can't go and work out just for the health part of it. But for some reason to me, it is that challenge. It's really exciting to see myself at one level and to figure out the strategies to get to that next level. And it really is a, a mental game in a lot of the ways. And so I find it interesting when I'm running especially those hours and hours you get into it how does my mind react how do I react what is my body capable of and I just find it fascinating to push the envelope to see where I get to because the exciting thing is is as soon as you get to that next level a lot of times you never thought you could ever get to you realize that future levels are possible as well and so I just find that exciting about opening up the possibilities that that's what gets me excited and actually, that, is it okay if I ask you about like a little bit of your background with the psychology thing in, in what you did for corporate entertainment or, or stuff like that? Uh, just like uh, how, how that's been part of something you've been doing for a while. Sure, yeah. And in fact, maybe I should, I should mention too that the reason I started getting into ultra marathons is I actually... Sorry. Wait, one second. I just need to restart the camera. talking that long <laughs> I know, you won't shut up. Uh, yeah so you're about to say the reason why you got into ultra sure I, I used to do triathlons like in high school I used to do some weights and things like that just to uh, get into shape because I was never someone that was into sports and when I got to university I actually started doing some triathlons my wife's cousin actually is, is big into triathlons so I started doing some swimming a little bit of running a little bit of cycling and I started doing those it was a lot of fun but there's actually a point where um I wasn't well like I got really really anemic so my iron levels my blood were extremely low I was nearly passing out and it was it was actually quite scary so I ended up going to a university doctor to try to figure out what was going on and just because of her um, her ideas as far as what to test for that I was diagnosed with celiac disease so celiac disease is uh, basically a condition where if I eat gluten 
which is contained in wheat, rye, barley, so a lot of, you know, bread products and stuff like that. Uh, you, the immune system starts damaging the inside of my small intestine, wears it all down, and I can't absorb nutrients as well. So I guess over years of not knowing about this, that my iron levels were going down, down, and down, and so it was, like, hard to really do anything. Like, I, I try to do some training, but no matter how hard I work, like, it's just, I just felt tired all the time, and, and it was really kind of depressing in that, I don't know, I, I wanted to get better and better and better, but here I was not healthy, and I was thinking, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just getting older, and I can't do this stuff anymore, or whatever, but there was one day that I saw a show on TV about an ultramarathon out in Alberta that's actually still happening called the Canadian Death Race, and it's, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great title, it, it makes people really interested, but it's a 125 kilometer running event in the mountains in Grand Cache, Alberta, and it, you know, extremely challenging. So I actually, at that point, said, this is something that I want to do. You know, I kind of want to prove to myself that I can still do these sort of things. It was my motivation to get off the couch and start training again. Because I got really tired and, and uh, uh, overwhelmed about as far as my triathlon training. It wasn't going so well. So this was a new goal that I had. And, you know, I went out and ended up going to that race. I did two years in a row. Both times, didn't finish. First time, like I mentioned, I hadn't done any even marathons at that point. The first one, dehydration. Dehydration about 60 kilometers in, it was really hot. I, I didn't know how to deal with hydration issues. I just wasn't experienced. Then the next year, I got to 105 kilometers approximately out of the 125. And I think it was just a matter of my mind just not wanting to go any farther. I remember I was going down a path in, in the woods there and I was just my my mind was just continually I you know I want to stop this is this is crazy I, I'd rather be in bed <laughs> you know it was hurting so bad at that point and I remember that my headlamp because it was in the middle of the night uh, it went off like my batteries had gone dead and I think that was just the the last straw that my mind just completely shut off and by the time I had fumbled through my pack to get batteries and all that I basically said that I was done and and I can think about all day long about how I could have should have finished that race but I mean you can't do anything now and I know that at that time again my mental conditioning wasn't there I didn't know how to deal with a lot of the issues the pain and the motivation at the time so yeah so it's been a long time of like I've entering races and I did several races and I just wasn't finishing it and it, it wasn't until I accumulated a whole bunch of experience that I was able to start actually doing them. So I, there's a certain level of maturity and experience needed to do these things, absolutely. So let's talk about the Slurpee Run. So uh, how did that idea come about? Tell me about where, where it comes from. <laughs> uh, actually, just hold on one. Sure. Okay. Am I moving too much or no, anything like fine. that? Okay. You're fine. Yeah, I'm just going to get a wider shot here. Just waiting mm. for the wind to come down a little bit. Yeah. So tell me about the Slurpee Run. The on that? Well, the Slurpee Run, it was actually uh, an idea, uh, a simple idea, I suppose, but uh, a great idea put together by a couple of friends, Melissa Budd and David Fielder. What their history was, was that they were running out one day on a Sunday, and it happened to be that they discovered that it was 7-Eleven Day, July 11th, 7-Eleven, 7-Eleven's birthday, and they celebrate, the 7-Eleven celebrates 7-Eleven's birthday by giving out free Slurpees. So they discovered that if they go visit a few 7-Elevens on that day, that they could use the free Slurpees as aid station points. Great idea, just something they sort of stumble upon. They did it for another couple of years, doing a little bit more. I think they got up to about seven 7-Elevens or whatever. It wasn't really a too planned or the map wasn't, you know, they had, didn't really have maps. They had a few jots and notes and stuff like that. And they ended up calling me up and saying, hey, you want to come on this? It's, we're going to do what we call a Slurpee run. And I'm like, okay, great. And it was, it was really great because instead of being really serious, you know, a lot of times, you know, ultra marathoners, they like just really serious and they're concentrating. This one, it was less about, you know, grimacing. It was more about the smiles. It was, it was, it was just a goofy, fun thing to do, enjoying Slurpees, going around town. I thought it was great. So the next year... I had suggested maybe I'll make a map. And in, so instead of doing the 30 miles and getting seven locations, we ended up doing 
uh, 21 locations of 31 miles just by doing it very carefully as far as plotting the points on the map and I realized that we could do any more. Well, it ended up being that 7-Eleven got wind of this. And I, at first I thought, oh no, we're going to get, get in trouble for taking so many free Slurpees. But in fact, they contacted us and said, this is a really cool idea. How can we support you? How can we be a part of it? And, and it was so fantastic. You know, they, they helped us out and, and uh, gave us some uh, hats and shirts and stuff like that. And, and they really celebrated our appearance at all these places. And it was really great. So they said next year we should talk earlier to see what we can do, right? Because it was last minute the time before. So then it got me thinking, well, if 7-Eleven's going to be a part of this, and maybe this might be the only time that it ever happens, what could we do? You know, last time we did 21 locations. Should we do 22? Should we do 25? I don't know. Like, what, what's an interesting number, I was thinking. And this sort of popped in my head. I, I didn't know the answer, but how many 7-Elevens are there in the city, and how long would it take to get to every single one in a single run? And I didn't know the answer. So I started plotting it out, figuring it out, and I figured out that it was about 71 miles. So I call it 71.1, but, but I GPSed it, and it's probably it's, it's somewhere in that 71 category, so certainly realistic to be in there. And uh, I don't know, I thought about it, and uh, we just ended up pulling the trigger and said, okay, well, let's do this thing. We're going to do what would be, since we're the slurpy capital of the world, there's no better place to do it. We're going to do every single one, so no one's going to be able to beat it, <laughs> unless they build another one. So there might be a part two if they start building more 7-Elevens, but more, more about that in the future. But, but no, 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 we want to do the ultimate one, do all of them, uh, have a great old time, invite people out. And uh, yeah, again, it's just a, it's a social experience. It's a, it's a fun experience. We all stay together and just kind of goofing off in the slurpy cap of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so when you decide, okay, we're gonna do this, and uh, and you start putting the word out, <coughs> what kind of what kind of response did you get first from? Actually, hmm. actually, first I'll ask you about Seven Eleven working with them on hmm. on what kind of support did they end up giving you for hmm. the slurpy run? Sure. And, and in a way, I almost think, because I don't want to promote that they they could help people out, you know what I mean? Oh, that's interesting. No, I'm just yeah, saying, not, what, what, they yeah, actually, yeah. what actually happened, like, what was their involvement in, in the end? Like, sure, they okay. They pay, pay for some bands, or, or, yeah. or, or, or they only have to say that, but, you know, they give you shirts, and, and you know, I, I, I and would like to touch on the part where you had permission to get free all the Yes. Papers. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. This is a special permission, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, just, just to bring that point up is what is why. Uh, sure, okay. Yeah. Uh, just one second. Hmm. Okay, whenever you're ready. So, kind of, uh, so what did 7 Eleven do to support your run? Well, yeah, the 7 Eleven was so great working with us. We're really excited, and they helped us out uh, at many points in the run. Now, first of all, 7-Eleven on 7-Eleven, July 11th, they give out free Slurpees, but only for a limited period of time. It's about eight hours. So that during those eight hours, anyone from the public can go into 7-Eleven location and get a small Slurpee for free. But then the problem is now, is that in order to get to all 45 7-Elevens in the city, it is going to take far longer than eight hours. So the first point was, is that they did give us permission that we were allowed to get free Slurpees for the, a full 24 hour period. So right from midnight uh, to midnight on that July 11th. So that was fantastic. They sent out emails to all the stores and notices so that when our group comes, they were allowed to get free drinks at the locations. Other things that 7-Eleven did, they, they gave us a whole bunch of t-shirts, which is really fantastic. They helped us out getting some support crew vans. They, uh, I don't know, you know, they were just really excited about it. They're really open arms. They said, come on over here, this is great. They put us in news releases so that all across the country, uh, there's little blurbs about our Slurpee run, like in the Toronto Sun and stuff like that. And uh, I guess we're contributing to the legend, uh, legend, we're contributing to the legend of the Slurpee capital of the world, Winnipeg. So along with the world's largest Slurpee that they created, we're also doing the world's largest Slurpee run. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just going to pause the camera there. With 
So now when it comes to finding people, how did you find people to go on the run? And, and how many people, like, uh, not necessarily numbers, but some people wanted to do the whole race. Some knew they were just going to come for portions. Maybe we'll yeah. talk about that. All right. Do we wait till the wind ties down a little bit? Uh, it's okay. Is it? Okay. Yeah. All right. So the year before our big Slurpee run, we had actually interesting response from people who are even not runners. They thought it was so cool, you know, hearing about it on social media that non-runners said, this is actually something that we would like to train for. You know, this is the motivation for them to start running, which I thought was really great. So they wanted to be part of it, but I knew that those people wouldn't be able to do 71 miles. You can't go from no running to 71 miles. So when it came to offering for people to participate in it, we gave them two options. One, you can run the whole thing with us. Or two, you can run part with us. So you could just do you could just do the distance between two seven elevens, five seven elevens, you could do thirty miles, whatever it is that you want to do. So that was offered out to everyone. Now, I really promoted this on social media, Facebook, I created a Facebook event, I shared it around to a lot of the different online running groups, and I thought at least in my mind, that we would be lucky to get four or five people who are going to want to do the 71 miles. But it ended up being that more and more want to participate. I think we had as many as 12 people saying that they wanted to do the entire thing. And then we started getting 25, 35, and more people wanting to do part of it with us. And I just couldn't believe how much the interest had ex just exploded, you know. And I was actually worried that... If all these people came at once, you know, if we had 30, 40 people all at once and we all came into the same 7-Eleven location to get Slurpees, that it was going to just fill the whole place up. Their normal customers wouldn't be able to get anything and we just overwhelmed the staff. So that was actually a legitimate worry. I was from, it went from worrying that we wouldn't have very many people to worrying about having too many people. And we actually, ha I had to start like stop accepting people <laughs> because I was just too worried about abusing 7-Eleven's uh, kindness to us. We didn't want to overwhelm them at all. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, the, the popularity of what we did this year with the Slurpee Run, I don't think that it's really something practical that can be done again. Like I always said that this is going to be the, the, the one and only time that we're going to do this big thing. But if for some reason... I or someone else decided to do it next year and they were to put out word like just the fact that all these runners were showing, showing around the photos and telling everyone how much fun they had we might have 50, 60 or more people participating you know and it, it's just impractical we're, we're, we're not like a big city marathon that we could just shut down roads and have aid stations and everything we're just dealing with these little 7-Eleven stores we, we just can't get any bigger. I, I think we just maxed out. We maxed out with number of stores, and we maxed out with the number of people that we could accommodate in this sort of event. So let's talk about the actual run. So it's midnight on July 10th slash 11th. Uh, what's going through your mind as everyone's gathering, you know, <laughs> starting to get a little excited, people are showing up, you know, it's 1130, getting ready. What, what's going through your mind while you're getting ready to start this run that you know for one you already knew it's gonna be crazy pop the next yeah. day and so what's going on in your mind at that point well the slurpee run even though the concept is quite simple it actually took a lot of planning like i swear for the for weeks beforehand from plotting out the maps and coordinating with 7-eleven coordinating all the people who are coming finding people's shirt sizes and the list went on it actually took a lot of planning it was just hours and hours and getting every little point correct making sure the stores knew what was going on and just, just covering all those bases it was a lot of planning so i think when it came to the point of you know it's just about that run time i spent so much time thinking about all the little details that had to be in place that i didn't even have time to worry about actually doing the run <laughs> but oh shoot, what was what was the next gonna go to sure ah oh, yes the temperature that's what it was yeah okay go ahead so we got to the first location where we were going to start and already people were starting to accumulate 
We had our support van in there with all the shirts and everything we needed. We had people there that I knew, people that I didn't know, and it was filling up and it was pretty it was getting pretty exciting, you know, like that that this was happening. So that was really great. Now, we knew what the temperature was going to be on that day already. I mean, it was midnight, so it was fairly cool. Like, at least it was comfortable. It wasn't cold, it was comfortable. But we knew that it was going to get really tough by the time that the sun came up. It was going to be uh, 30 degrees. It was going to be humid X close to 40. There was extreme temperature warnings out there from Environment Canada. Like, this was going to be actually pretty serious. So Environment Canada was calling for on that day 30 degrees more or less and close to or at 40 degrees with the humid X factor in there. And that was really my main worry, my main concern. Because I knew that, I mean, you can get medical difficulties, you can get dehydrated just by sitting on the side of the pool in that sort of temperatures, just by sitting in the backyard and having a picnic. Now we're taking people all throughout the entire city, quite literally, running. And we're going to be running through the entire hottest time of the day. And anything could happen. And I knew that it was something that we all had to concentrate on and look out for each other. We had to make sure that we stayed cool, that we took in enough fluids, that our support crew was able to get water and ice to people when, when they needed it. And that was going to be the main challenge. Because quite honestly, at that point, because I was trained for the distance, I wasn't so much worried about the distance factor, it was the heat. Because the heat could, uh, could affect me just like anybody else. All it takes is uh, a few times that you miss out on drinking that maybe you should have, and then, then that's it. It's, it's really hard to recover once you've uh, gone into that dehydration. So as you're starting, getting ready to, to leave the first store, is all this going through your mind at that time, or are you kind of just, I'm ready to run and figure it out? <laughs> or uh, what, what, what's, what are you thinking of right at that time? As you, you're all gathering the stars and you're about to shoot up the door. Yeah, yeah. What are, you, what, what are you thinking? What are you looking forward to at that point? So it, become, it, comes min, sorry. it becomes midnight, and it's time to go. And quite honestly, I was relieved. Because I had spent so many months, even close to a year planning everything to the minute detail I was just finally happy that I was running and actually doing it so it was actually quite a relief I had my map in hand and you know what honestly at that point I just felt the responsibility as a leader of the group I wanted to make sure that we got to the right places we followed the map correctly uh, we didn't lose anybody and that sort of element so yeah at the beginning it was mostly just how do, I, how do I go with this group? How do I work with this group? And, and how is it going to go? What the speeds are going to be? There's a lot of things up in the air. Sorry. So, and how many, there were quite a few that, that kicked off the race, right? I believe, uh, I, I don't know what the number was, but it seemed like that was the most oh, yeah, people yeah. were right. at that time. <clears throat> so, so we offered to have people who want to do part of the run, they could, they could choose what time they wanted to go to. They could go at any time. And I was actually worried that maybe at a peak time of the day, say 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that we might have everyone come together. And that was a legitimate worry. We didn't want to all squeeze into a 7-Eleven. But amazingly, which I wasn't expecting at all, is that we had the most amount of people at the, from the midnight 1 a.m. sort of area. And it must have been probably a couple of factors. One, the temperature. So it was the nicest part that you're ever going to get. Like we started... We started at the coolest time it was ever going to be for this entire run. And two, I think two, because they could predict exactly when we were going to leave. Because after this first point, it, it was up in the air as far as where we're going to arrive at their location, all that. And so anyone that actually wanted a strict time that they knew we were going to leave at the midnight there. But yeah, I, I know a lot of people who were going to do in the afternoon or during the day who decided to move it to midnight because that, <laughs> that was going to be the time that was going to be much, much easier. Yeah, when they saw the temperature that was coming up and yeah, 
Because even at midnight, it was not, it was probably like 18, 19 degrees or something. It wasn't cold. Yeah. It was, I remember thinking, oh, this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. let's get a piece of camera here. All right. Uh, All right. So we, we started right at the midnight, and the temperature is actually, even though it was the coolest that it was ever going to be, it really wasn't that cool. I think it was around 18, 19 degrees. It was still humid. So it was nice in that we weren't sweating a lot, but it wasn't cool by any means. And I just remember at that time, I really got to enjoy this and really soak it up because it's only going to get worse as far as the temperature goes. And that was going to be the main challenge of the day was the temperature. So let's enjoy these early morning hours and really appreciate uh, the, the temperatures at that point. So during that, those, that early morning, uh, you know, say the first seven, eight hours or so, what, uh, were there any points that, that stand out to you as interesting parts of the city? I mean, as far as you're starting off in Transcona, going up to the northern part, and yeah. all over that area, right? Yeah. I'm just going to give a second for the wind to sure. down. Yeah. Um, so what are you thinking while you're running? Are you just enjoying the sights? Are you thinking, in 10 hours, this is going to suck? What, what's going on through your mind at that point, during those first hmm. few hours? Yeah, well, for the, for the first while, during the dark hours before the sun comes up, as far as, you know, most of my main concern was just being able to stay on map and on schedule. I, I, wanted, I wanted people to have a great experience, and that was my main worry at the time. And it was an area that I'm not familiar with. I'm in Charleswood. We start off in Transcona, and we're going to East Caldona and areas like that, really areas I'm not familiar with. I had run these areas before just to test out the course and all that, but I'd never gone in the night either, so it was actually kind of unfamiliar territory for me. But yeah, my main one was just making sure that we stayed on track, we stayed on the right streets and all that. A lot of the times I was looking behind me to make sure we weren't leaving people behind. It was sort of hard, even throughout the day, to pick a pace. Because there's always going to be someone in the front, and the people in the front will ultimately set the pace. And so I had to keep looking behind me to make sure that we weren't leaving anyone behind, and that we would wait for anyone that started to slow down and however actually yeah that that is uh a question i was going to ask about about pacing because some people can be better runners than others so if you have to sort of go for the lowest common denominator in that case to accommodate for people uh, hmm. how, how does that work in, in a you know a fun run hmm. where it's not a race sure maybe, yeah. and if you could address that that this is a fun run it's not a race yes yeah so this is really a group run it's for fun everyone's meant to stay together it's not meant to be competitive at all. And we really welcomed anyone that wanted to come and run. But at the same time, I mean, if you're gonna pick to run 10 miles, we understand that you're able to run 10 miles, right? You're not gonna bite off more that you can chew sort of thing. So I did say that we would go at the speed of the slowest runner, but at the same time, sometimes people get into trouble and we would have to make judgment calls as far as were they going to be able to participate further? Did they want to get picked up by the van? Should we slow down for a bit? And that was really interesting to me because it was, it was so many balancing different factors. Because at the same time, I wanted to get the run done all in 7-Eleven, all on July 11th. I want to get the whole period to go. And especially those early morning hours, I, I, like it's okay to go slow, but I didn't want to get too much off track right at the beginning. Well, I noticed at the beginning, too, you were at a pretty good pace. You were ahead of schedule, quite ahead of schedule for the, in those first yes, eight or yeah. so hours. Yeah. Uh, it was that on purpose? You're like, yeah, we're feeling good. Let's, let's get it in there. Well, well I, I'd done a lot of calculations as far as timing goes. Okay. I had a lot of people asking me when I was going to be at certain stores. And at first I said, there's no way I'm going to know. Just watch the website. You'll know once we get going, once we're getting closer, approximately what time we're going to be there. But I got so many questions that I finally started putting out a spreadsheet. Uh, I was looking at time of the day, the distance between locations, our target of doing in 24 hours. And I put together a little bit of a check sheet as far as when we might be expected to go at these different locations. So we started out and 
honestly, it was a bit of a surprise that we were going faster than I thought we were going to. It was, it was cool, and it was going to be hot later. So I didn't really purposely slow people down because I knew that once it got hot, we would be going slower, we would be visiting more locations, and maybe if we can bank a little bit more time at the beginning, it might be advantageous. But really, the pace was always set by the people running at the front. Uh, whether that was myself or anyone else, who's ever at the front, we pretty much follow that person. And it, it became difficult sometimes to make sure that we stayed together as a group because some people, they got, you know, they're, they're a faster runner, they get in the front, then they kind of lose track with what was going on or they're chit-chatting and having a good time. And then slowly they just start like, speeding up, speeding up. And then we start having people in the back struggling and so we had to make sure to pull them back a little bit but yeah it was always a challenge to get a pace that was right for everybody and a pace that would get us to the right place at the right times really okay. and a lot of that was done in the planning you did ahead of time right as far as uh, okay we're going to be here at this time be here at this time and that was very handy by the way because i used those really yeah. planning as well because <laughs> right? i had to meet my crew at different spots and, yeah and uh, i remember on the crew saying, oh, we're in a totally different area. They're here. So they're way ahead of schedule. <laughs> they're like, like uh, it was like an, at one point you were two hours ahead of schedule. Yeah. And, you know, I was like, okay, maybe I won't be doing this till 11 p.m. So that, that was okay. Um, well, I was I was talking with my wife, who is part of the main support van. And and maybe you'd say her name like I was talking with my wife, Chris. Sure. Yeah, I was talking with my wife, Crystal, during the run, and she was one of the two people in the you know, basically our main support van that stayed with, with us for the entire duration of the run. And she was mentioning that, she, she kept saying to me, you guys are going too fast. Because I guess when I put out the sheets as far as where, where we were going to be, potentially at what time, people were going on, logging on, to, waking up, logging on their computers and realizing that the stop that they wanted to meet us at, we were like two hours ahead of schedule. <laughs> so they either had to like rush out as soon as they could or find a, a new location to meet us at. But uh, I don't know. But at the same time, I didn't want to slow down. Like if we're doing well, we're not going to just like slow down more than we had to. But, but that, that was certainly an interesting challenge because no matter what I predicted, like who knows what's going to happen on the day. Well, ultimately, were you in charge of, I mean, it's not, you know, you weren't charging fees or whatever, but you were the guy running the show. It's okay to just yeah. admit it. <laughs> <laughs> People are looking to you yeah. for information, for leadership on this as well. Sure, yeah. Well, really, you know, as an ultra runner, I'm used to running a lot by myself not a lot of people run these really long training runs and in order to coordinate it with other people I mean it's near impossible at times so I do a lot of running on my own and when I do go to group runs they're usually smaller group runs but I'm usually most comfortable in the back like I'm pretty flexible I can go a little faster I can go a little slower I'm kind of right in the middle there and I don't mind other people setting the pace I don't mind other people going in the right, you know, picking what direction we got to go. But this was a little bit different in that now I was the guy that sort of designed it. You know, I'm the one that designed it. The, the, the original idea wasn't mine, but the idea to make it so big was mine. I coordinated everything. I invited everyone. Everyone was asking me questions. I kind of knew everything that was going on that you could know. And I ended up being the leader, which was actually a little bit of an uncomfortable position for me because, again... I would rather just have other people call the shots and I'll just go along with it. But here I was in a situation where I was the leader of the group. In a lot of ways, I felt a lot of extra responsibility to stay in the race because I knew it was going to be hot. Like anything could happen to any of us. I've dropped out of plenty of races along the way. Bad decisions would have taken me out. And so along the way, I always felt this heightened sense of responsibility that I always had to monitor my body um, and and respond to any uh, if I was getting too hot if I was getting too thirsty if I was getting hungry um, all these other factors I always had to stay on it all the time I was hyper aware of all things that were going on with me because I knew that if I 
you know, let any of that stuff slide that I may drop out. And I didn't want to leave the group. Well, so let's talk about uh, the run as we get near, I think it was about halfway or so, uh, we got to the perimeter over that bridge in Charleswood, right? That's more than halfway, maybe. Uh, anyways, but I, I, from what I understand, a lot of people were starting to feel it around then, right? Because it was getting... Okay, start. Okay, this is where it started. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just one second for yeah. Okay, we're good. Yeah, I actually ahead of time in little chunks I tested out the course. So I, I I ran it to make sure my maps were correct and everything made sense before the day. So any mistakes were taken out of the day. And when I was doing all these testing, I pretty much predicted where the challenging spots were going to be. And it was on Ness Avenue and also on Pemina Highway. Because I know those two areas, they're fairly long stretches of nonstop running. And it's all concrete, no shade, and direct as far as the sun goes. So sure enough, the first time that we really started having people struggle, including myself, was along Ness. It was long all the way from the 7-Eleven location close to Polo Park. We had to run all the way to Sturgeon. And we were running, and again, the sun was just coming up at that time. It was just at the right angle, and it was hot. And we were running, and yeah, that's when people started really having challenges. It, 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 the heat was starting to affect us. Like, I can't really talk too much about other people. Like I know what my experience was. because By the time I hit that Sturgeon and S location, I, I just felt exhausted like like it, it, like all the life was like sucked out of me like I knew it was just because it was so so hot and 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 it wasn't just me too I think we took a picture and we were all just kind of laying around it was literally that's what we felt like you know it wasn't acting at all and so I knew again because I needed to stay in this um, we went I got slurpy uh, that's when I started getting uh, ice in my hat I, I did everything I could to say you know what if I'm gonna stay in this game I, I gotta get some strategies involved here because it's only gonna get warmer so what kind of strategies you mentioned strategies to keep cool because it's only gonna get warmer what were they yeah well, strategies for keeping cool, one would be I had a very uh, specific strategy when it came to hydration. Pretty much I watched my watch and every 10 minutes I had pretty much like a mandatory drink. So I had two water bottles with me all the time. Every 10 minutes I made sure I had a drink. Whether it was just a, a small little sip, whether it was a big chug, whatever, I need to make sure that constantly drinking. Because if you leave too much period of time without drinking, you get in trouble. And if you drink too much all at once, you can actually get stomach problems too. And so in order to stay hydrated, I knew we had to have constant influ like I knew so we didn't get in trouble, we need constant water coming into us, the hydration, just constant coming in because we're constantly sweating all the time. Also, ice is also great. You know, a lot of times these big marathons, you'll have buckets of ice there and you can put a whole bunch in your hat, stick your hat on, and then it's just so cool up there and just melting down feels great. Now the great thing about stopping at 7-Elevens are they have ice machines, right? With their soda machines. So it's great. Every time I went to one, I put my hat under and just pushed the, 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 the little uh, lever there and ice would fall into my hat, stick it on there. Now, the day before, I had, uh, someone had given a suggestion about ice around the neck, and I had never thought about this, uh, about getting a, you know, a, an extra sock or whatever and putting it around your neck full of ice, uh, pin it closed or whatever, and I, th I thought that was a pretty good idea. I'd, I'd never tried it before, but I figured because it was extreme, I would try it, and that was wonderful too because it just that's where you have all the, your, your veins going through your neck and just cooling off, and all that ice melting and it's coming down on your shirt, and now I'm just covered in ice water. I'll tell you, like it felt great <laughs> that particular day. And, and if it wasn't for that ice, 
I, I don't I don't know if I could have made it because I'm pretty susceptible to dehydration. I, I've had a lot of problems in the past and I had to work those out. Well, so let's talk about then uh, the, some of the trouble that Ray had. Now, I, I talked to him about his trouble, so you don't need to comment on his experience necessarily, right? But yeah. just from what you observed, or not from what you observed, but at, uh, you know, as the, the group is doing this together, it's a group event, right? And people are you know, watching out for each other to a certain extent. Uh, what did you see going on when, uh, first off, Ray went to the support van to get a ride yeah. to the next one, um, and then he passed out in between uh, going to Osborne. Um, well, I'll, I'll back up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you, bet. you know, s- starting at Ness Avenue, and we got to that first 7-Eleven, that's when I first started noticing that we had people starting to have trouble because of uh, some level of heat exhaustion or dehydration. And we had to stop at more locations for a longer period of time to make sure we took care of ourselves. But it was interesting in that, you know, who was being affected by the heat would sometimes change by different sections you know someone would dip down in some trouble areas they would recover and then someone else would start having trouble or someone would want to have a ride with the support van just from one stop to the other and they'd join us again and they'd feel better because they had a little bit of time to cool off now i know that so so i should talk about uh, race by name specifically yeah yeah, sure okay sure i think i think it was around the academy location that Ray started saying that he was having some uh, problems of some sort. I heard it from someone else, and I know that he decided to go ahead of us. He was going quite slow, so he figured that if he'd run uh, ahead of us a little bit, that we could meet him up. You know, he wasn't going to wait as long at the 7-Eleven. He'd run ahead, and we'd catch up. And, and that was fine. We caught up to him part way. I don't know. He didn't seem too bad, but I know he was struggling a little bit. Then at the next location... I hope I'm remembering this correctly, but the next location, he decided that uh, he was going to hold back. He was just going to let us go forward. So we went ahead of him. And then at some point in the period there, he caught up to us again. Again, uh, so I'm like, wow, I, I, thought, I thought he was going to drop out at that period of time. So he, he certainly seemed to have a, a bit of a, a roller coaster ride as far as how he was feeling. And then it was that by the time we got to the cordon location, he started to drop. And certainly he wasn't the first person to drop. Many, or s- several runners who are better runners than I had to drop out even by that period of time as well. Well, so we, we're a smaller group after, once we got into Osborne there, we're running down Osborne. And I remember looking ahead, and I knew we were... Oh, maybe we'll wait for the... Yeah, I'll just do a second. Sure. No, that's good. How we got? Ten thirty. I might I might grab a drink from the van if we're gonna be. Sure, I think we'll be oh. another half hour. Sure. Maybe, maybe I'll finish this thought and I'll go get my. Uh, sure. I had a diet Pepsi in there. Sure. Okay. All go right. Ahead. Whoa. Oh yeah. Okay. So it was coming up on the. Uh, you're running. Oh, it's windy again. Yeah. <laughs> that windsock is okay, but it's not. Okay. Here we go. Uh, All right. So you're coming up on to the Osborne. Yeah, so we, we had a smaller group running down Osborne. We we're just about the 7-Eleven, but there were a whole bunch of buildings. It was kind of tucked, the 7-Eleven was tucked behind some of the buildings. So you couldn't really see it. You can kind of see the peak of the sign there. And my wife, Crystal, who was part of the support van, I see her come out towards the sidewalk and she starts waving at us kind of excitedly. And at first, you know, I, like Suyin and I were kind of talking, I'm like we were thinking that Maybe there's like a 7-Eleven special event. Maybe the mascot was there. Maybe there's some of the managers there to greet us. Maybe it was the news people, something. But I was expecting it to be something positive. And we got there and there's a fire truck and an ambulance there. And she said immediately that, you know, basically there's a problem with Ray. And that was, it was quite the turn of events as far as, you know, we thought we were going to come into something that was celebratory, but some big, big problems there. So obviously we were pretty worried. There was a, a stop, right? People stopped to see what was going on. So what were you thinking of at that time? We think, oh, this could put us behind schedule, or is Ray okay, or how am I going to manage this? Are people going to want to keep going? What, what were you thinking of while we were stopped to see what yeah. was going on with Ray? Well, we, we always knew that if someone was going to get into trouble, that we should wait 
and make sure that we can take care of people as much as possible. And I remember my, my first thoughts when I heard that there was trouble in the van along the way, that I was grateful for two things. One, that they were able to call the emergency uh, assistance and they got there very quickly. And also I was grateful too that his wife was already en route to meet him there, even if things all went well. So I was, I was really glad that at least he was in the right hands because I'm not sure if like we weren't educated enough to provide that level of you know support that he needed there so I was really glad that the right people were there and certainly we waited around there just to make sure everything was fine I mean we would have stopped anyway and it, honestly it was a reminder that we need to drink anyway so <laughs> it was a good time to get some icy beverages in you know and uh, figure out what was going on but uh, no I'm, I, I'm glad I'm really grateful that we had support crews there. I'm really grateful that he was with the support group. You know, instead of just running along, being the tough guy, that he made the right decision to be with them, and that the support team was able to call the uh, emergency uh, vehicle staff quickly, and uh, it, it worked out well in a bad situation, you know? And, and, and he was fine, too, and he was able to get the IV or whatever they did there and uh, to make sure that he was okay. So at least even though obviously I was concerned, I was glad that he was in the right hands. You wanna pause there and sure. you can get a drink? So what I'll ask you about after this. No, that was really good for us, that show, so. All right, we're rolling. So so we're past, we're past a point now where it's about uh, two o'clock and um, you know, Ray has been taken away and you know, we've just gone to the hospital. We can't do it. He's taken care of, so we'll keep going now. So That's the time, eh? I realized I never even knew what it time it was. Two, yeah, because remember, it was just before my crew change, which was at about 3 o'clock, which is on, on the stop on Pemina by the Tony Romas. Yeah. It was just before you got to that really long stretch of yeah. torture. <laughs> so let's talk about that stretch down Pemina. Where you're like, there's just one pe one location way the heck down there, right? Added probably an hour to the run just to get to one. But I understand the principle of the thing: you get to every 7-Eleven. I appreciate the purism. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, tell me about that stretch getting down to that point, down to that location. Sure. Well, we got on. We started Pemina Highway, and I knew that that was going to be the big hurdle. That was the last big hurdle that we were going to get past. It was going to be hot the whole way, so we had to somehow survive that. Now, something was actually happening with me just as we started down Pemina too. I started getting this pain on the side of my knee, which I thought was strange because it's not something I've never really had any knee pains before. I ended up figuring out later that I think it was because I kept shoulder checking for runners behind me all the time. I would do this funny kind of sidestep all the time. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so starting Pemba Highway, I started getting a sore knee. We're having to do a little bit more walk breaks. We were slowing down. I felt bad for the people who were joining us at, at that time because we were going slower. And uh, But yeah, it was hot. And eventually by the time we got to about the university or so, um, uh, Su Yin also was having some trouble. Uh, the back of her knee was hurting a bit. So pretty much from that south location on, we were doing a power hike. We were just walking, right? But we were going at a pretty good pace, both of us. So that, that worked out pretty well. But we were just walking and walking and walking and walking because we can still get pretty fast by walking. Uh, but it doesn't put the same sort of strain on the knee. Anyway, I went into a whole other direction there. That's good. Yeah. This kind of faster. That's what I mean by rambling. Let's get all, all direction. It's all usable good stuff. Just look at that spot back there for a second. Okay, so um, you're power walking, and yeah. now the heat's starting to get down yeah. on you. Yeah. And so, how how are you feeling? Again, heading to that south mm. Peminal location. Yeah. So the the first real the tough section was that Ness, but then the second going down to that south Pemina location. We're going almost all the way to the perimeter. It's all concrete and traffic and sun. And we knew it was going to be tough. 
but it was really tough. We were going slow all the way down there. And you know what? My lowest point, personally, was going down there. By the time we hit that South Pema location, I was feeling it really hard as far as the heat goes. I was uh, kind of feeling a little disoriented a little bit. I knew I was in trouble. I, I, I was just kind of frantically trying to get drink. I was, I don't know, I, I was pretty low at that point in time. I think that we spent the longest period of time there. I don't know if it was just because of me or if other people are having troubles too, but I, I, I had to spend a lot of extra time as far as staying hydrated and cooling off at that point in time. But again, it was one of those times that I had to listen to my body and I knew I was in trouble, so I needed to correct that then and there because I knew we had to go on the Penman again for another long stretch. And we had to go on to the Bishop Grandin uh, over the bridge, again, all in the sun. And uh, yeah, yeah, I guess that was probably my lowest point, a uh, scary point there. How, how do you take care of yourself when you're in a situation like that, when you know that you're hurting, oops, when you know you're hurting, <laughs> your legs are giving you trouble, how, how sure. do you take care of yourself? I'm never one that's really good in running in the heat. I was telling people, and quite honestly, on that day, if I was going to run, I'd be probably running in my basement in the air conditioning. <laughs> I'm not typically one that would ever go out in that sort of temperature, but I had a responsibility this time. So I'm not really used to having to really deal with that kind of heat. But I am experienced in a lot of ways as far as I've gotten into trouble with dehydration before, and I sort of know how that feels. And some of the things that can happen to dehydration is you can feel ill, feel a little disoriented, um, all, all the energy can be taken out of your legs. There's, there's a lot of different signs, but I was definitely quite disoriented at that point in time. But how do you take care of yourself? I mean, in this situation, I knew I had to cool off. So I put as much ice as possible all over me. <laughs> I fill up my water bottles. I made sure to get a big Slurpee at that time and just take a little time. You know, I, I think I spent a few minutes even indoors at the 7-Eleven in air conditioning, um, just trying to cool off. I, I think that I probably left the group for a bit. <laughs> but again, I knew I had to take care of me. Sometimes you have to take care of yourself first. I, just, what was it? I was going to mention something else. What was it? Oh, yeah. Hey. On, the, on the stretch down to Pemina, one of the support crew uh, ladies, she uh, asked us a question along the way. I think she said, you know, do you guys want some ice or something? And apparently based upon my response or how I replied, I apparently sound very angry and annoyed at her. <laughs> but she understood, and we talked about it later, that um, I was just grumpy <laughs> because I was hot, not feeling well, and really hadn't slept good that night. It was, it was interesting their observations about how people dealt with the lack of sleep as well. And, and yeah, you know, people get a little bit extra moody, and she knew that my personality isn't to get grumpy with people, but I was at that point in time, I guess. <laughs> that's, that's interesting you say that because I never noticed, like, when we pulled you over for an interview or to do stuff, yeah. you seemed pretty good spirits, so I could tell you were hurting and you're tired. So, I mean, yeah. even guys in my crew were getting grumpy, <laughs> you know, and, and we were not doing the same, you know, physical things that you were doing. Yeah. So, did, did you, you must have noticed at that South Pamela location I wasn't doing so well. Oh, yeah. Well, you mentioned it too. We pulled you over for an interview there. And yeah. At, at that point, I think I wanted more to go get my drink yeah. than to stand there with you guys. Yeah. That was about the only time. <laughs> <laughs> I, rem I remember, I remember okay. thinking to myself, maybe if I could just go do that stuff first yeah. and then come back. Yeah. But I was a patient guy. <laughs> yeah, you were very accommodating. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I could tell you just wanted to like lay down and have a nap. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would have felt so good. But like I said, that that was my lowest point yeah. at that point because I was just so hot, and and that was the second point. You know, it was like I had gone, I, I was gone to that line. You know, where you're either going to take care of yourself or you get into trouble, and it even experienced runners can make mistakes or read the signs wrong or make the mistake of thinking that they're tougher than they are or they can work through stuff um 
or or just having too much fun i don't know and, and you let things go you don't take care of yourself and things go wrong and and many people many people had to stop because of the heat that day well and because uh, as i recall you ended up originally oh go ahead reach for yeah. it if yeah. i'm asking a question yeah um originally i, I thought there was gonna be about a dozen that were planning on doing the whole thing right you end up with three that made it yeah uh, i think six started i believe Okay. Well, if you include Ray, I don't. He never declared that he was going to try the whole thing. Okay, I just remember seeing earlier on it looked like a certain number, anyways. Yeah. Um, but but regardless, uh, what, but once we left Pemda and started going down the Bishop Grand and St. Mary's, it starts to cool off, started to rain a little bit. I felt like people sort of got a second wind, though. There's still a lot of power walking going yeah, on. Yeah. But just people, the spirits seem to pick up. Can you tell me about that? How how that change once uh, some rain came it cooled you guys off a little bit what was going on there yeah once we got to bishop grand and we had been power walking quite a bit and uh the, sh- the clouds started coming in i think it got a little bit windier uh, we went a little bit farther it started spitting rain a little bit and certainly you know that changed the whole mood of the whole thing so just pause for one second Sorry. i'm gonna have you re-say that it changed the whole mood go ahead from the beginning or just it's that just thing it changed the whole mood of the whole yeah. thing the clouds are coming in and it changed the whole mood it started to get cool uh, it started raining a little bit there's a little bit fear of actually that there's a risk of a severe thunderstorm and those clouds that were coming in were really dark <laughs> and we could tell off the distance that it was just pounding so it was a bit of a conflicting thought in my mind where i wanted it to rain on us to cool us off but I didn't want it to just power, like plow on us and, and really drench us because that would make the, the rest of the trip a little bit more uncomfortable. But no, certainly once it, we got through that hot section, we survived it. We got a little bit more shade. The clouds started coming in. It started to cool off a little bit. We were starting to get motivated about walking even faster because we wanted to stay ahead of that rainstorm. We didn't know what kind of trouble was going to come in. I know uh, as far as the people doing the whole thing, it was uh, Wade, Suyin, and myself. Wade, he wasn't really in the walking mood. Like he, he was able to still run at that point in time. So because of the risk of the severe thunderstorm, he actually he asked if he could run ahead a little bit, and we were fine with that. So we let him run ahead. And Suyin and I were just power walking, power walking the whole thing. And we were really trying to race that storm. <laughs> it put a little uh, fire under us. To get moving. Did you see that dog? He was in the water. No, it's interesting too that Wade, like he's kind of muscular guy, right? You know, he had more to carry on that run, but he seemed like just, you know. I was a little surprised by that because you think runners are usually more slender, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Because it takes energy to carry that extra muscle. Anyways, this is my little layman's observation, anyways. But so you're getting cooled off, you're power walking, now you're getting to Bishop Grand and coming up St. Anne's, and, uh, and then there was a nice spot too when you're going down uh, Furmore right down that walking path. And people seem to be going pretty good. You started running again at that point, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure if we did. Well, you might have been walking still. Yeah, I might have been walking. I, I think. on my bike. Maybe yeah. you were walking. Anyways. We're, we're, we're going pretty fast. Yeah, I mean, up the pace. Yeah, I, I have, I've actually been practicing a lot of walking. Oh, sorry, Scott, I'm just going to... Sure. They were, they're made to shoot stills, right? People just started using them for video because they look so good for video. And uh, but they're not made for video, mm-hmm. so after 12 minutes, they oh, that's all I want to record. Uh, but newer ones don't have that issue, right? This yeah, is a yeah. couple years old, so. Anyways. Sir. So uh, we're at that point. You're up going down St. Anne's for more that area. This yeah. is picking up a little bit. Uh, you have a few more people with you now as well. Yeah. Sure. And once we got to around that Furmore area and we had some new fresh people coming in, some people from the beginning, you know, spent whatever they did during the day and they came back again, brought some new life to the group, which was really great. And it was cooler. And so we were starting to see the end approaching, which is really great. And we didn't have to stop as much as the locations to stay cool anymore. So I remember... We started skipping past locations as far... Oh, we took pictures. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, so, 
Yeah. So right. let me ask you a question yeah. right on that. Uh, just to go way back to the beginning, you don't stop at every location to have a surfing. Right? Oh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, what do you do at the ones you're not stopping at for surfing? Sure. Well, one of the traditions as far as the Slurpee run that started with uh, Melissa and David is that every location that we go to, we take a group picture. And so that's the tradition that I wanted to continue with this. Now, there's 45 locations, and we only have 24 hours. And if we were to stop at every store to get well, food, water, drink, Slurpee, go to the washroom, whatever it is, it would take hours and hours and hours of spending time in those stores. So we had to make a decision that even though we want to take a picture at every single one, we were only going to stop at maybe every second one or so on average. So yeah, so at every location we took a picture, but not every location did we get drink. Just uh, when there was a long period of time, we went to get aided there. But we made sure to visit every location just for the whole principle of the run. <laughs> no matter how inconvenient it might have been. Okay, no, great. Uh, now that we've got that point, so back on to... Uh, you're in that section again, you're not having to stop at every store, yeah. um, and you're seeing the end coming near. How are you feeling at that point uh, while well, you feel, okay, there's like three or four more stops, or like we're like an hour away from being done, maybe? Yeah, I, th I think for that last stretch, um, if I remember correctly, and maybe you can correct me on this, because it's, it's interesting that the observations from Crystal mm -hmm. and my observations... They can be different. Yeah. <laughs> she saw different things. It was different. Even though I was there for the whole thing, yeah. her experience sometimes was different. Her observations were different. Yeah. Just give a second to write down. Sure. So I think that uh, at that point, I'm just talking to you now. Yeah. I think like it was, it was pretty much the people who were staying in it. So we're approaching the second last 7-Eleven location. And who do we see? There's Wade. Yeah, Wade had gone ahead of us to keep away from the storm, but the storm didn't materialize after all. And what a great surprise that he waited for us so that all three of us who had been there since the beginning, you know, myself, Wade, and Su Yin, that all three of us were able to start and finish the Slurpee Run together. And it was such a great surprise. I, I felt so grateful that he was there. Uh, it was such a kind thing to do. And uh, it, it was so great for us all to be together to finish that run. And now as you're approaching that last 7-Eleven, you, you're running down that street, you see the sign on Marion, you're thinking, here it is, I'm almost there, I'm two blocks <laughs> away. How are you feeling? Uh, yeah. Is the pain gone away? Is the adrenaline pumping? Sure, What's yeah. What's happening for you at, at, at that moment? So between the two last 7-Elevens, there's just this tiny little distance there. It's just practically one street, a few blocks, and definitely, you know, we had the energy come back. Any pain or fatigue we are experiencing they're all gone you know we don't not feeling that it's now just the excitement of finishing and everyone was kind of like cheering and this is this was fun and we knew that everyone was waiting at the last spot so even though we we're still power walking it put just a little extra fire in our step and moving along and yeah it was it was it was great it was, it was a lot of fun um and really being able to soak in that last little bit and how did you just so you know i don't hear them the mic's pointing directly towards you yeah uh, how how did you celebrate? Check, how did you celebrate that moment? <laughs> you're at the last seven eleven. Did you get a big old Slurpee? Did you get a big gulp of quarter on your head? What did you do? <laughs> well, okay, sorry. Just like we had started the first location with the Slurpee, I knew that at the end, even though we weren't going any farther, we had to end it with a Slurpee. So I took my favorite Slurpee, Dr Pepper Slurpee, just like it began. Had a good slurpy at the end sucked it dry and just really appreciated the uh the moment at the end there <laughs> sorry i don't know if that was describing it properly <laughs> no, but yeah yeah right. i'm just wondering no, I'm, I'm not picking them up hey. that kind of microphone is very directional sure. at least here's what's directly in front of yeah. i'm just making sure <laughs> are you still running still running yeah, yeah. so so yeah so at, at, at the end I wanted to make sure we got our last Slurpee, went and filled up the cup with my favorite, the Dr. Pepper Slurpee, and just kind of relaxed in the parking lot just for a few minutes to let it soak in before we go for our final ride home and be able to get a little sleep that night. <laughs> how, how did you sleep that night? Did you go home, have a bath, shower, or what did you do? Well, usually after a run, I'm pretty, you know, psyched up and it takes a little bit of time to calm down, but yeah, got in that shower, 
had an awesome shower. <laughs> my kids were at my parents' place that night, so we were able just to go to bed, and uh, we got to sleep in, which we did not always get to do, but yeah, we got great sleep. I, I, should, I should mention that, uh, you know, the, the night before, we are going to start at midnight. And midnight is like the worst race start time ever. <laughs> Be, because you, usually, you know, a lot of these ultra marathons, you start in the morning. So you get the advantage of having an entire night's sleep and starting fresh. So you're not tired until well into the evening or night later. But here, most people aren't going to get much sleep at all for a midnight start. And so you're already started behind the ball, right? But, you know, my, uh, Crystal and I, we, we went to bed, I think it was 5 or 6 o'clock. <laughs> had a few hours. Had, had a few hours of sleep, uh, which is amazing. But again, you know, starting at midnight, and we're all going to be tired right from the beginning. So I was certainly worried about being uh, tired. But I guess with the, uh, with the Slurpees and the soda and the caffeine, <laughs> we, we did okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what about this weekend now? Uh, Ray decided he wanted to keep, and again, I've talked to Ray about this a lot, so I won't yeah. ask you too much about it other than he decides he wants to finish it. So what do you think about that? About now a whole bunch of people are saying, hey, I want to do it too, let's, let's finish the race right now. Yeah. What do you, how do you feel about that? What do you think about that as far as community goes, or about the event continuing yep. on, whatever it is? Uh, there's a, yeah, and I'm... Go okay, go ahead. Are they not too loud? Looks like they're going to be there for a while. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'll, yeah. I'll ask you about what you think about this weekend. Sure, okay. Yeah. Sorry, okay. okay. So, so we had our Facebook page. Sorry. We had a Facebook event for this where everyone got to comment and all that. And everyone was concerned about Ray, especially the support crew people. You know, our support crew volunteers, they were part of it, and they wanted to make sure that Ray was okay. So they're asking... And he ended up replying something to the degree that he was feeling better now. And once he recovered a little bit more, that he had unfinished business. That he was going to go back to the location, the last location he was at, to finish the race. So that even though he didn't do the whole thing together, like all at once, that he could say that he ran to every 7-Eleven location. Well, I'll tell you, he posted that. And I swear, it was only like five or ten minutes later, the first support crew person said I want to be there then like five minutes later other support crews I want to be there and, and instantly they, they are already there they want to support so I said I would be there I would run with them and other people started speaking up that they would run and and I thought it was it, like it's such a great thing as far as the running community that they all wanted to be there and you know this this is not something that I orchestrated you know, I had planned like this whole thing, but this is something that grew legitimately organically out of the people who were there and, and just caring, right? So I think that this weekend is going to be really neat because it's going to be a, a different experience. It's about celebrating, I guess, what, what, would, be the, what would be the right word? I'm going to plug that for a second. Sorry. Sure. Yeah, so you're still going to be looking at me. I'm going to try not to That'd be great for the blooper reel oh, too. <laughs> All we see is your reaction to me falling. <laughs> okay, so this weekend, unfinished business. How did this come about? All right. So on the Facebook event page, everyone was asking about Ray. How's Ray doing? And especially our support crew people. And Ray posted on there that he was feeling better, gave us a story about what happened. And he threw out there as a comment that he still had unfinished business, meaning that he was going to go back to the spot, the last 7-Eleven he did, and then he was going to run all the way to the end and follow the map. So even though it wasn't done all at one time, he could still say that he ran from 7-Eleven to 7-Eleven in entirety. And you know what? I think it was only up there maybe five minutes, and both support crews, you know, they both spoke up and said, we want to be there. We want to help Ray. And I said, well, I'll be there. I'll run with him. And a whole bunch of other people also said, we'll be there too. You know, we want to be a part of this. 
and and it's it's such a beautiful thing in that you know like I orchestrated this whole Slurpee run idea and I planned out everything but this this part is legitimately you know it grew organically just out of the community just out of people caring and, and I think that's a really beautiful thing about the whole thing it's gonna be a different atmosphere uh, it's gonna be shorter uh, but it's just gonna be a great experience you know as far as just people supporting people and helping people out and I think it's pretty cool it is it's gonna be a lot of fun absolutely <laughs> that's all I'm looking for for coming from on that last video. yeah <laughs> Back and listen to yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure I get it clean, you know. While sure. Here. Yeah, I can see it all over again if you want. Okay, Scott. Unfinished business coming up this weekend. How's that come about? <laughs> On our Facebook. Oh, sorry, it was a here. <laughs> At our Facebook event page, everyone is concerned about Ray. They're asking about him, and he posted. Oh wait, I'm gonna start over again. On our Facebook event page, I know there's people asking about Ray, making sure he was okay. Especially the support crew people, because they were there and they knew what happened and they wanted to make sure everything was good. Well, Ray posted that, well, he was feeling better, but once he recovered more, that he had unfinished business. He wanted to finish the rest of the one. He was gonna start at the last one that he hit, the last 7-Eleven, he was gonna run to the end. So even though it wasn't in its entirety all together, that he can still say, that well, it's too windy for you, isn't it? Just that, that last phrase. Just yeah. Phrase. You can pick it up at that, that, even though he's not doing it all in one day. Sure. That's where we'll pick it up. And just keep it here. So even though he's not doing it all at once, at least he can say that he went and ran to every 7-Eleven in the city. Well, he posted that and it probably was within 10 minutes, both support crews said, we wanna be there, we will support him. We, they'll use their own vans, everything, they wanna be there. And then, well, I spoke up, I said I wanted to run with him and a whole bunch of other people spoke up too. So there we are, we had now an event. <laughs> we had the unfinished business Slurpee run and uh, I'm really excited about it. It's this weekend and uh, it's gonna be a whole different kind of atmosphere. It's people helping people. It's something that grew organically where it wasn't something orchestrated by me. It was purely the running community getting together to, to help one of their own. I think it's a real beautiful thing. And if you could just repeat one part for me where you said um, uh, the support Crew said they would come in with their own vans. So, Ray posted. I think I think your camera went that way a little bit. There we go. Okay. One sec. It was just a little windy on, on one part that you said. So you would cut that all up, or you want me to say it again? Seems to be from over there, I think. Use your body to walk the wind in here. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Let's see. Not the most sophisticated, <laughs> but it'll still pick you up. I'm gonna make sure I get this nice and clean, you know? All right, All right, so. So look at me and go ahead. On our Facebook event page, everyone was asking about Ray. Well, Ray spoke up and said uh, he was doing okay now. He told his story and he said that he had unfinished business, that he was gonna continue the run starting from where he left off and go all the way to the finish so that he can say that he ran 
to every 7-Eleven. Maybe not on the same day, but he did it. Well, I bet you it wasn't even 10 minutes and both support crews said right away, we want to be the